David Brin, Seanan McGuire, James Patrick Kelly, Paolo Bacigalupi. Find these authors and more in Vital, The Future of Healthcare, edited by R.M. Ambrose and Aidan Doyle. Back this project today at vitalanthology.com slash kickstarter. That's vitalanthology.com slash kickstarter. Podcastle, episode 599 for November 5th, 2019. The Two Choice Foxtrot of Chapham County by Tina Connolly, rated PG 13. Welcome to Podcastle. I'm your host, Setsu Uzume. Today's story, The Two Choice Foxtrot of Chapham County, was originally published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and was written for you by Tina Connolly. Tina Connolly's books include the Iron Skin and Seriously Wicked series and the collection On the Eyeball Floor. She has been a finalist for the Hugo, Nebula, Norton, and World Fantasy Awards. She co-hosts Escape Pod, runs Toasted Cake, and can be found at tinaconnolly.com. This week's narrator is Julie Hoverson. Julie Hoverson is a woman of mystery and horror, and occasionally sci-fi. She writes, produces, and acts in the audio drama series 19 Nocturne Boulevard, as well as appearing in many other shows. She also is working hard to promote all scripted audio dramas through the Twitter feed at A.D. Infinitum, and hopes one day to take over the world. And now, pack a bag for surprise visitors and enjoy the story. The Two Choice Foxtrot of Chapham County Written by Tina Connolly Narrated by Julie Hoverson There were two things we girls all knew that summer. One, that Tony Latham had turned into the finest drink of water ever to strut this two-bit, one-horse, no-account town. And, two, that Susie Appleby was going to have a stone baby. Susie never was one for chasing the boys. That was the funny thing. She told me later she'd been sent to get a packet of tobacco for her dad at the general store. And there was Tony sorting out the three-penny nails from the four-penny screws, and their eyes met over the hogshead full of metal, and that was that. There's only two choices if you're going to have a stone baby, of course. The first one, and best one, is you get the daddy to marry you, and if you're quick enough, you can catch most of it in time. Sure, the baby's born with a little flint toe, or a patch of marble back of her left elbow, but that ain't too uncommon in this town. Mildred Percy's got a whole swatch of granite on her skull where the hair don't grow. She combs it over and we pretend we don't notice. Our fathers maybe give Mildred's mother an extra wink in the grocery store, and we pretend we don't notice that, too. You get good at pretending things here, and we got real good that summer. Because, thing was, Tony Latham knew he'd turned into the finest drink of water, etc. And he didn't have no interest in tying himself down to poor Susie Appleby. The hot summer rolled on, the air heavy and wet. The boys worked in the fields and swam in the watering hole on their days off. We girls picked the gooseberries from the thorny bushes nearby, our arms scratched through our tight sleeves, and tried not to watch the boys dive into the cold, enticing depths. We jammed the berries and put up the plums, and we watched poor Susie get hotter and heavier day by day, weighed down by her stone baby. And finally her dad came home from the haying and he saw it too. There are two things a parent can do when they find out their daughter's rocked up. 
One, you go hunt down the stone daddy and you make him marry your daughter and that right quick. Susie's father chose the other way. I guess I'd been nicer to Susie than I ought to be, because when he turned her out, she came to me. It was thundering, too, lightning fit to crack the skies, and Susie all drenched, the cotton wrap she'd let out twice clinging to her rock-hard belly. There are two choices for a girl in my situation. One, ask her in, and have my dad turn me out, too. Two, turn Susie away and go back to embroidering pillowcases that say his and hers in real fancy writing. But I looked at Susie's eyes, and I listened to that rain, and somehow I went off script. I hollered to Ma, Hogs out again! And off I went into the downpour with Susie to find the witch. The witch lived out past the watering hole. Her place was nothing special, just a one-room cabin going all mossy. She scolded Susie for being soaked, and then she looked at me like I oughta have stopped the rain somehow, got Susie here dry. I didn't have any experience of what my choices were to say to that. We'd run right off the map. The witch's sharp eyes measured me. Then she told me to go pick some peppermint by the third willow past the oak. You try picking peppermint by the third willow past the oak in a thundering downpour. I was soaked in rain and mud by the time I got back, which I expect was what she wanted. She'd pulled the whole story out of a hiccup and Susie, who by now was snuggled in a nice-looking wool blanket, the kind Mildred's ma makes. The witch shook her head and said stuff about how Susie ought to have come before the stone baby started but it's hard to imagine how a girl would be desperate enough to do that before it happened, you know? One visit to the witch's house, and you might as well be carrying a stone baby. I shifted uneasily, knowing what choice I'd already made tonight. The witch said to Susie, You got two choices. She laid them out real quiet-like, but I guess we already knew them. One... Keep that stone, baby. Keep it all yourself and keep it forever. That's the sort of choice that ain't much choice at all, less than you want to be an outcast witch yourself, and I expect she knew it. Two, you go to the watering hole. You take this particular mix of herbs. After a lot of pain and suffering, that stone baby will slide out of you right down into the watering hole and be just another rock in the mud. Susie paid the witch with her favorite dress of Liberty Print Violets, and we went through the mud-slick rain back to the watering hole. The rage of the storm had passed, but it was still trickling down, and the path was slimy beneath our feet. We stood on the edge of the water. It was black as night. Susie said, You think it would be bad to keep it? Awful lonesome, I said. Would you come visit me? That ain't the sort of choice I really had either. But once you get off script, you don't exactly stop. And I said, yeah. I reached out my hand and her fingers gripped mine and I thought that maybe going off script wasn't all bad if I could lighten her burden. She stared at the herbs in her other hand. That's when Tony appeared on the other side of the hole. Easy, easy, he said to Susie like he was gentle in a calf. Don't you go do nothing foolish. We we can fix this. You're, you're coming back to me? Her eyes lit with hope. Guess so. Your dad's pretty insistent. He rubbed his chin where a purple-blue bruise was spreading. Guess her father decided it wasn't too late to make the other choice after all. The light dimmed in Susie's eyes. The moon lit the water in hole as her chin set hard as granite. I ain't coming back to you, she said. She pulled away from me, cast the witch's herbs into the water, gone. I knew her future then. 
living alone at the edge of the woods with a quartz-edged girl by her side. And I would go back and forth to see her, each visit a crack, a chink in my wall, each visit lifting her burden but weighing me down, for the weight of shame is a fixed price, leastwise in a two-bit no-choice place like this. Ain't no way to lighten it for everyone, and it suddenly made me mad I couldn't. Susie turned to go and her foot slipped in the mud. Heavy with the stone baby, she slid down the lip straight into the pool. I grabbed for her, got nothing. Tony did dive for her, I give him credit for that. Nor he didn't want to carry that guilt heavy as stones. But ten minutes passed, and even if he had found her, she wouldn't have been there to be found. I helped haul him up the mud, and he panted on the side of the rocks. Even through his guilt, he looked at where my dress was plastered to me, and I saw then how stone babies could spread. That Tony would wink at me in the store like our fathers did at Mildred's Mall, and everyone would look the other way and be certain I was no better than I ought to be. I backed away from Tony, crossed my arms, and glared at him till he left. I stayed there till dawn, long after Tony had gone. Morning, Susie, and something else I didn't have a name for. But those who stick around see things, and so I saw it. The stones like birds rising from the water. Little stone figures, no bigger than a hard round belly, and a massive mother-shaped one at the front, rising on invisible wings. They rose slowly, gaining their bearings. They spread out into a V, and then they went south, a migration like none had ever seen. There are two things you can do if you see something that's never been seen before. One, you go back to Ma and Da, your hem-stitched pillowcases and your uneasy dreams of stone geese. Stay silent when they say they dredged the water in hole and found nothing. Or two, you rise one morning, your feet light as biscuits. Fill one of those pillowcases with everything you think you might need. It's a long walk to the south, but it's worth it. If you find a city of women living there, hard as marble and light as birds on the wing. And welcome back. Sometimes around college campuses or in the worn-down, artsy part of town, there will be signs advertising women's self-defense classes. Maybe a week-long series, or maybe a single seminar for an hour or two. And at the heart of the thing is good intentions. I'd never fault anyone for wanting to spread knowledge and know-how. But the good intentions aren't enough. And the key component to self-defense, or negotiation, public speaking, first response, anything, is deciding right now honestly, what choice you're going to make under future pressure. Some fight, some avoid and keep their head down, and both methods are perfectly viable. The other thing these classes don't teach is the way that the moment decides not just the encounter, but the outcome. It's dealing with the fallout of that choice. Maybe an hour is all that's needed to fix your head one way or another, but it's a long road from intention through choice to fallout. And that's the preparation I desperately wish those classes taught. In most cases, that's not enough time to get to the heart of the matter. But with time and luck and a bit of grit, you'll choose a path that fits you best, for real. One that ends in knowledge and know-how and, you know, wings. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone here at PodCastle, our audio engineer Peter Baravesh, our forum moderator Aussie Cat, your co-editors Jen Albert and Sheree Clark, along with all of our fantastic first readers, Matt Dovey, Aidan Doyle, Ebony Dunbar, Amalia Harrington, 
Kai Hudson, Devin Martin, Catherine McMahon, Ace Ratcliffe, Julian Jarbo, Craig Jackson, Julia Pat, Hamilton Perez, and Eleanor Wood. Thanks for letting us share another story with you. Podcastle is part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Feel free to share it, but don't sell it or change it. If you like what you heard, head over to patreon.com slash EA podcasts and subscribe. Special shout out to Enigma the Crusty, whose nose whistle sighs a plaintive tune on misty nights. Not stormy ones, and definitely not clear ones. That wouldn't be proper. We'll be back next week with another tale. See you then.